Annie Prue is here. She is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning The Shipping News. In her new collection of short stories, Close Range, she uses Wyoming to describe a brutal world of rodeo riders, ranchers, and farmers looking for a little dignity in life. The book is already receiving rave reviews, and the leading story in the collection has been selected by John Updike as one of the best American short, short stories of the century. I'm pleased to have her here at this table. Welcome. I'm pleased to be here, out of the rain, uh, out, of, out the of, rain. of the snow. <laughs> <laughs> when you think of all the places you have lived and worked, I mean, are you happiest in Wyoming? Yeah. Wyoming's my writing place. I, it's, it's, it's just a totally charged place. You go into it, and it's almost as though you were trailing a little cord behind you and plugged into the side <laughs> of the mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a friend who lives actually in Jackson, which you consider a different part than why right. you live in. But he gets up in the morning, and he takes a camera, and he just goes out, and he shoots all day, and he comes back in. And that's, all, that's what he does. I mean, he's so, and he's an Easterner who's so captivated by the country. It's, it's quite extraordinary. It's, it's like you're standing there with your mouth open all the time. It's big country. It's exciting, interesting, vigorous country. And... You walk, you climb, you just can't help yourself. It's a great place. <laughs> Do you think the natives are different because they're shaped by the sort of the, the sharpness of the land? Yes, uh, I think that's true of all rural places anyway, that uh, what's there in terms of climate, what's there in terms of the, the way the wind blows, the geology, the geography, uh, how you make a living, who was there before you, all... all um, orders your life in a way that urban and suburban lives rarely are ordered these days. So, so you find yourself in a kind of a massive uh, story that you can't help. Mm. I, I, I'm, I'm struck by the notion of how it might en enhance the, your powers of observation because of it. Mm. Well, long sight lines when you can stand at your kitchen sink and look out the window and see a hundred miles down the road yeah. and that's something. Um, that, that long sight line combined with, with walking shifts uh, your thoughts in, into a different way. It's, it's almost literally like, like, the, like the closed horizon that you get in the east and the south from masses of greenery and walls and houses and so forth. It's, it's all gone and it opens wider and wider and you're, you're on the beam. Yeah. <laughs> you're there. But is there any reason to believe that you, with the skills that you have developed and the craft that you have, would be any different, right? It, it, that the power of observation you have could do the same thing for an urban life. I don't think so. I, I'm I'm at home in a rural situation, and all of my writing has been about rural places. And I, this is something that really interests me: what people, uh, what writers handle an urban um, scene in a novel well so that the story moves through the, the urban landscape and of course the striking one is uh, Ulysses yeah. and a, a very very fine example of it in this country is Joyce Carol Oates What I Lived For which in in this Union City New Jersey that she describes has got the this entrepreneurial fellow whose whole life is 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 moving through the architecture the old nightclub the old athletic club it's, it's a beautiful job that's the most successful american um landscape urban novel that i know it's it's a beautiful piece of work have Hard you to do have you <laughs> <laughs> she lives in princeton doesn't she um, I think she lives in She teaches yeah. there. Yeah, so she, she, she lives probably does near nearby. Close by. Right. Uh, let me come back to this and we'll come back to other writers. This scene. Right. Comes this, from. Um, William Matthews, the painter whom I met at the cowboy poetry gathering a couple years ago in Elko, yeah. Nevada, uh, painted the cover and the inside illustrations. Really, this is right. the first piece of illustrated adult fiction Scribner has published in. 60 years. The first piece of... Uh, the, the first of, novel, fiction, illustrated fiction. Illustrated That's, fiction. How did I say it? It sounded well, rather peculiar. It, yeah, it did, but Adult I, fiction, right. Exactly, <laughs> but we got it. Yeah. This is the first piece of fiction that they have illustrated. Yes, yeah. correct. And was that your idea? No, it was Willie's idea. We, we, we had a good time hanging out in Elko and went to dinner at a great Basque restaurant there. In the early, just, just a lot of... Basque? Basque. Is yeah. there a Basque contingent? In Nevada, in there's Nevada, a very large Nevada, one, right. yes. Wherever you find um, uh, sheep, 
you'll find, find Basques. Basques. Yes. And okay. there are lots of them in Wyoming and also yeah, I knew Nevada. there was in Nevada, right? Right. There's a great restaurant in Elko, the, the Star, I think it is. Great big long tables covered with oil cloth, and you sit yeah. next to perfect strangers. No table is smaller than seating 16. Yeah. So I ran into Willie a couple of weeks later by chance in Denver, several hundred miles away. He said, gee, if you ever write anything about the West, I'd like to uh, I'd like to do the cover for it. And I said I'd fly it past my publisher, and they, <laughs> they were pleased. And then next time I said, I not only like to do the cover, I'd like to do some inside illustrations. Yeah. Well, Willie, they don't illustrate books no, anymore. I, <laughs> so. But just look at, can I show some of these? We'll show them better. Uh, but look at this. I mean, these are really. They're quite marvelous. Oh, yeah. Um, and it did turn into a true collaboration because I changed some of the stories to suit. To suit the um, illustration? Yeah, and he changed some of the illustrations. I think he had to repaint that one you just went past with yeah, the I'll girl with the tractor. tractor. What a great... Uh, he first painted a red Fordson tractor, which he said had beautiful bones, but yeah. it didn't fit the story, so we had to go back and do a John Deere. Yeah. <laughs> John Deere's are always green and, and Fords were always red, right? Right. Look at this. This is another illustration of a horse in the kitchen, almost. It is indeed, yes. <laughs> that particular story with two chopped off yeah, legs. Yeah, right here and right here. The, 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 like the half-skinned steer. Yeah. Which was selected by, uh, for the 100 best short stories by John Updike. It is a raw, tough, uh, <laughs> horrifying story. That's funny, too. And funny. <laughs> but where does that come from within you? Um, <clears throat> that, I don't know. I can't answer that question, but I can answer part of it. That came by way of the Nature Conservancy, actually. Right. Um, Barry Lopez had, had urged them some years before to do this nice collection of essays. Writers would write essays, and they would publish it, and it would raise money for the Nature Conservancy. And they did it, and it was a success and wonderful. And Barry said, why do you do that with fiction? You know, short <laughs> stories. <laughs> And they asked me, and I said, yes, the fiction was all to be based. Each one of the writers could choose a Nature Conservancy site, go to it, hang out, um, and draw some kind of thing, inspiration or whatever, from the place, and then write a short story based on it. So I said, yeah, I'll be happy to do it if I can go to a Wyoming site. And there were three. And one of them was the Ten Sleep Preserve uh, at the uh, south uh, end of the Bighorns. And I went there and, and lived in an old revenuer's cabin. Um, he was a preacher on the weekends and a revenuer during the rest of the week, uh, during the 30s or the, the 20s. revenuer means someone who goes out and... I'm sorry, he was a revenue evader. He, ah. was, a, he was a bootlegger is what he was. Yeah. Uh, so I stayed in his I thought a revenue cabin. might be like a revenue agent who would go out hunting yeah. bootleggers. No, uh, this was the hunter. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, this <laughs> the, the hunter. <laughs> the hunter. <laughs> And um, and that story came out of it. And when I had such a good time came writing the story, um, I don't know. I, I just you know tramped around, looked at things, went down the Billy Creek Trail, and and looked into the canyon. There's a river that goes underground, and it was uh, working from the landscape. And these characters just fell out of the landscape. Can we tell what the story is about? Um, yes, we can. All right, tell us the story. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> Uh, or I'll tell it, but I'd rather you do because it's your story. It's actually fairly complicated. Right. Uh, an elderly gentleman in, from Woolfoot, Massachusetts, or it seems from Woolfoot, Massachusetts, is called back to Wyoming to his brother's funeral. He left home 60 years before. And uh, on the way back home, there are flashbacks to a story that, the, that was told in the home kitchen with the old man and this character's brother and his father all there by the father's girlfriend. And the subject of the story that she tells is uh, an old Icelandic uh, folk tale about a steer that was skinned, but only half skinned before the work was interrupted. And the Because he went in to take a drink. Yes, or something <laughs> wonderful like that. And the steer laid a heavy curse on the whole family. So Escape. that's the story within the story. So the steer is hung up and escapes. Yes. This, he leaves the steer lying or hanging, hanging right. comes out, and it's gone and, and disappears. So this story that was told 60 years before in the kitchen comes back to circle around in an odd and disquieting way and to make this story of the old man's return from Woolfoot, Massachusetts to Wyoming. 
it's a, not an easy story to tell just off off the cuff. Yeah, but it gives a sense <laughs> of what we're talking about. Because it's a story within. <laughs> what is it you admire about cowboys? Nothing. Really? Hmm. You just find them interesting? Well, actually, there are very few cowboys in there. It's um, I, I look more at ranchers, I think. Than, okay, then and, I'm, but and I'm using the term hands, in a broader term. Right. Okay, redefine to ranchers. What is it you admire okay. about people who live and inhabit ranches? Um, sim uh, the the thing is that, again the place. People are self reliant. They're um, able to do things. They're competent. They're in tune with the country and the surrounding. They. Uh, they make a very tough place to make a living work, just barely. And I like that kind of self-reliance. But once again, what I'm doing is writing about place. And the characters carry the story they carry. I know carry you the say place. that. The characters come out of place for you. Yeah, they do. Uh-huh. You, 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 you choose place, and it, but what about story? Um, the story comes out of place, too, but, or does the story begin, and that gives you place, which gives you character? No, no, the story comes first, and from place comes the economic situation, uh, which is really what moves most people's lives, how they make their livings or don't make their livings. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. That's just the basis of what I write. You know, here's this place. It's got such and such. It's got mountains. It's got seashore. It's got this. People have to make their living doing this, this, and this, and somehow the story's there. It did, so. okay. But, it, but, but you will grant me that lots of people start with a character in their head. There is someone mm -hmm. on some kind of journey. Truly, truly so, yeah. yeah. But um, I come to it, I guess, by a back door or something. It's just, the, it's really an edge situation in terms of cultural and, and, and social profiles that intrigues me probably from the study of history, and, it, and it's the place, the prevailing uh, character of a particular rural situation, and the story's always there. How do you write? I mean, you, early in the morning, late at night, oh, yeah. I'm, with a long hand, I with a typewriter? I get up in the middle of the night and write. The do best really? times for me are from 3 a.m. to about 7 watching the light come up and, the, and there are a lot of sunrise scenes and first light <laughs> scenes in my writing so that's <laughs> sitting it sort of there. seeps into your, through your eyes into your brain right I can look out my window and see an, an old antelope who uh, lies up on a hillside nearby and then the morning's early light he gradually becomes visible <laughs> so I sort of have an antelope clock for gauging the time but, um, and this antelope makes its way into your stories uh, he hasn't yet no Oh, he's got to. Come on. You see him every morning. <laughs> it would be only fair. Uh, I see a lot of things every morning that are not going into my stories. <laughs> no, why? Because? Um, you. No, I, I, I was just remembering that we started to talk about that cover and why it's regarded okay. differently oh, yeah, in I, East I, and I, West. I'm glad you brought me back to that. And, and it's kind of important. I forgot it myself and I just yeah. noticed. Someone in the East will look at this and say this is... Um, a, a, a landscape with snow and a horse, and and it's obviously western and right. it's beautiful. Right. But somebody in the west will will see that, and an involuntary shudder will go down their spine because. because it means very big trouble. Something tragic has happened. That's a saddled, uh, bridled horse standing in a dangerous landscape, and there's no rider. Something has happened to the rider. The horse looks cold and lonely. And when you see that kind of situation in the West, it, it, it means there's a problem, problem somewhere. Yeah. So that, that speaks to a Westerner in a much different way than it does it's, to a That's almost rom romanticism versus reality, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first thing I actually, my first thought of when I saw it was, where is the rider? Not so much right. that the well, rider's in trouble, but where yes. is the rider? Well, you ride, right. so that's, that's, the, that's the good response, or the response, I think, that Willie wanted to evoke. You're also known, and I wonder where this comes from, for the economy of word that you use. I mean, you are a very precise and economic writer. You wouldn't say that if you saw the first draft <laughs> <laughs> or the so, second or third. So, so we have an editor to thank for this or what? And you're the editor. Yeah. Are you right. edited much? Um, no, I'm not edited much, um, at least not by my editors, but... <laughs> I myself am pretty savage, and these these things went through a lot of drafts, uh, 20, 30, and really? more drafts, yeah. Uh, because I have a problem with too, cramming too much into the pages, uh, always trying to stuff more stories and more characters and more events and, and, and more of everything in, 
um, I've had to develop some kind of a scalpel response to my own work, and that's just a. Was it painful for you to do? No, but it's tedious. <laughs> More tedious and painful. I mean, after you come up with what might be some very good lines, right. and a good story, a good paragraph, right. But if you become, I mean, what is it in your you head? You have to learn to throw things away. You've yeah. got to throw it all away unless it really works. You have to um, say to yourself, what? What? You put, your, put yourself in the head of the reader? Um, no. Put, keep yourself in the head of the writer. And um, what Hemingway called the built-in you-know-what detector. Yeah. Uh, you There's just, a full letter word begins with S. <laughs> yes, and ends with T. <laughs> and... You, you have to be aware of that. What's, what's indulgent? What goes over the edge? And you have to stop short of that point um, and exercise a lot of control over it, particularly in the short story. You don't have room to swing dead cats around. So you've got to... Um, swing dead cats around. <laughs> well, Is that a Western expression? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, Hemingway was famous for, for his for editing. I, mean, I think I read where he once said, I've never written anything that I hadn't rewritten 32 times. It, you know, it's, if you're going to, to pare it down and write, write uh, concisely and tightly, which I think short stories request... Uh, by their very nature, you, you just do it. You just have to do it. Just scrape away and scrape away. It's like making a piece of furniture. Do you write with a computer, typewriter, mm -hmm. longhand? No, uh, with a, a felt tip pen and piles of paper and old envelopes and uh, whatever comes to hand. And why I have you put resisted technology? No, I haven't. I put it on the computer uh. in the afternoon. You know, just, <laughs> <laughs> print it out and then revise and go back again. <laughs> but the, the speed of the computer, the, the, here's, the, here's where the problem with writing on the computer is. It's so easy uh, and one becomes become so facile that you're apt to fall into cliches. I mean, they just pour out, blah, 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 you know, this, the, yeah, this exactly. stuff. But if you're writing by hand, you know, with your tongue stuck in the corner of your mouth, very slowly and earnestly, um, the, building the architecture of a story, there is a thing like physical drawing. If you sat down to, to, to draw a building or a landscape or something on a piece of paper, it's just like writing a story, only you're using words instead. So I end up with a piece of manuscript that's got arrows and, 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 and towers and, yeah. and double boxes with little fringes and all that sort of thing and, and reminders to haul this away. And so a story is like a building. It has an architecture for you. Truly does. Truly does. And, um, and I think it does for most writers, too. And perhaps I'm a little more conscious of it because I've been scraping away, you know, removing the words and, <laughs> until you get it down just so the sentence can barely stand on its legs. <laughs> it, have you written your best work yet, do you think? I mean, do you think that... God, I hope not. Yeah. No, no. Um, I mean, does it get... How does it... How is, how is writing this different than writing Shipping News? Oh, massively different, um, not only in terms of, of place, here we are again with that, yeah. but uh, because they're short stories uh, and because I was trying to, to use a very compressed kind of medium. And it just is. I'm, I had, I think, probably more fun writing shipping news. Uh, Why? And, and just because it's a different kind of story. It was a funnier kind of story. And and these are harder I pieces see. and more realistic pieces. And that was deliberate. It's, it's nice to switch your tone now and then. I hope to God I haven't written um, the best thing I can write. Um, I'm um, I, I ask that because of, exactly that's the reason I ask <laughs> is that you feel yeah. the sense of the learning craft for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Straight up. Uh huh. Do you are you influenced by what you you are, if you're a great reader you're obviously influenced by what you read in uh -huh. terms of you look at sentence stru you look at the architecture of writing. I do, uh, and this is not something I think that's deliberate in in your eye when you're reading, but it seeps in after you read enough. And God knows I've read a very great deal uh, from the time I was a little kid. Um, Who's influenced you the most? Or yeah. among them. Yeah, I among can't, them. I can't say because I don't. Among know. them, you can't say. No, I haven't. Actually, I have a list, but it's a very long <laughs> list. It has at least ninety names on it. That's my 
briefless when I'm asked this question, and they made me leave it in the other room. <laughs> I had this, you know, big, thick wad of manuscript. Let me read my list. <laughs> Do you want to write nonfiction? I did write nonfiction for a long time, I and I still occasionally yeah, as, as do. As a journalist, yeah, part. right. I, I still occasionally snap back into that um, <laughs> mode and and do a, a little tiny piece. But actually, the fiction is so pleasant to do because you can lie all the time. I mean, you can just invent things, forget the footnotes. Well, invent the, is better than lie because most people think that through fiction you can get closer to the truth. Yes, well, that's, that's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> you rolled your eyes in, in credulity, did you? <laughs> oh, it could be that through life we're getting closer to fiction. <laughs> no. I thank you for coming. Oh, it's my a great, great pleasure. pleasure to have you. Mine. Uh, <laughs> don't don't get up yet. Let uh -oh. me. <laughs> I just want to. I just find the cover remarkable. I mean, I really do. I think that who, if you are in part responsible uh, with Will for doing this, then uh, more power to both of you and for the publisher for uh, an illustrated. I can't tell you uh, how pleased I was when when my editor Nan Graham said yes, we're going yes. to do it. Uh, I also want to show you if this doesn't look like a Wyoming. <laughs> person, I don't know what oh, does. Oh, that's the V-Bar Dude Ranch <laughs> in the background, just down the road. <laughs> All right. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, my pleasure. Close Range Wyoming Stories by Annie Prue. We'll be right back. Stay with us.